Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life 180, and for this video, I'm gonna be responding to a customer's, or not a customer, but a subscriber, a follower's uh, comment where they were asking about, Chris, what about cap rates in Index Universal Life uh, products? And we talk a lot about cap rates, but what about uncapped products? Because this person was obviously being sold an uncapped product, and at the end of the day, what I'm gonna show you in this video is why the uncapped product is a very big smoke and mirrors game. I'm gonna show you why. I'm gonna kinda of show you what to avoid. And ultimately what I'm utilizing is I'm using a nationwide IUL, uh, the nationwide uh, New Heights Accumulator IUL as uh, kind of just an example because it shows a lot of different options as far as index strategies go. Uh, I'm gonna go through each one, kinda of what to look out for, what to avoid, uh, some questions that you need to ask, and then ultimately show you why the uncapped products are a bunch of smoke and mirrors, even though they offer some uh, short-term possible benefits, right? Because if you look at the short-term possible benefits as far as how it can uh, give you bigger returns, and there's a lot of people that have seen, like for instance, a lot of people are out there showing the uncapped indexes from after the pandemic or when the pandemic started March of 2020, through uh, you know 2021 at that time frame, that was March of 2020. I think it was March or April of 2020 when the market was like at its low, and then the market went just bonkers for the next year, right? And it just completely recovered and had this V-shaped recovery. So a lot of people are utilizing those time frames as this kind of outlier example, showing people what it can do. Now that can happen. I'm not going to say it can't because it can and it does and it did. But the bottom line is you can't sell a product or you shouldn't sell a product based on long-term views and then focus on this one little myopic uh, one-year environment that looked like it was uh, it, it, it's what you can bank on every single year when in fact uh, nothing could be further from the truth. You can't bank on that result at all because of the other variables that the insurance companies have in play. At the end of the day, it's why I say I'm not a big fan of IULs because once you sign on the dotted line and you sign that contract with an IUL, you are giving up control of all the moving parts of that policy to the company. To You're putting it in the hands of the life insurance company. They have the ability to move all the variables around. Even uncapped products have other variables and, and levers inside of the policy that the life insurance company can move to uh, manipulate it at their whim. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my board here. And I'm gonna blow this up here, and I'm gonna go to the board, and we're gonna kinda just go through this. So, a couple things I wanna show as we look at this. So, the one thing I wanna notice uh, before I get into a lot of detail here is that we have these ones that I underlined right here, here, and here. These are the S&P 500 indexes available on this product now. Um, there are other companies, other products that offer um, that offer different variations of options. You can see down here that we have other uh, index options, the JPM Mercury Plus, the Global H Factor Plus, the JPM Mercury High Par, Global H Factor High Par. Like there's, there's all these, these are what we would call, I think here to here are what we would call proprietary indexes, right? So the, these are all proprietary indexes. And so when we look at that, I'm a huge advocate for the fact that proprietary indexes are just garbage, quite frankly. They're such smoke and mirrors. And here's why. Look at this. I mean, the S&P 500, you can see the 30-year historical average here is 7.33%. Based on this assumption, uh, based on this one, it's 7.4%. And where's the other S&P 500 here is 6.32% based on that. And so when we look at that, then we get to these proprietary indexes and they have just these crazy numbers with crazy assumptions as far as the look back, the 30 year historical average. Now, the problem is with these proprietary indexes is that what they did is they back tested. And, and imagine if I, I could build an index so it illustrates really well and makes it look really well for you that it's gonna perform amazingly, but the bottom line is it's not gonna perform amazingly because of the fact that when we look at this index and, and, and we, we back test it, 
they say, and, and I'm not going to go into it on this, but there are disclaimers basically saying, hey, like every uh, prospectus that you look for uh, on, on, a, on a mutual fund or, or any kind of investment, it says past performance is not indicative of future results. Well, if I get to look back with a crystal ball and be like, hey, I'm going to build this index so it illustrates really well, so it's going to look like it's got this good historical average, but that has nothing to do with what it's going to do from here forward or that it's even predictable they, they, they have the ability to cherry pick all these investments to make it look really good to fit their mold. And when I say proprietary indexes, I basically mean all these indexes were created simply for this use, simply for uh, the use of IULs, right? Like, and and that, is, that is something that you need to understand. And they do that because of the fact that the options costs on all the S&P products have gotten so expensive that the only way that they can control those costs are by creating proprietary indexes. And you know, that it illustrates better, but the bottom line is um, you know, they, they go, hey, it's gonna get 5.74%. That's really conservative because look at over the past 30 years, it's been 10.09. And so then they illustrated it that, and it's a bunch of malarkey. It, it, it just is never gonna work that way. Um, and so it's, it's important to understand how that stuff works, right? And so, so now let's get into this. I wanna, I wanna kinda take this to the next level and now talk about, uh, let, let me bang out here the, uh, the initial one, which is a cap rate, right? And then I'll get into the no cap. So you can see here, I'm gonna change my color so we can operate here and, and see what we're working on now that I've, I'm changing topic. So you can see here, Cap rate is 9%, it can go as low as 4%. The participation rate is 100% guaranteed. So this is basically saying anywhere from nine to 4%. So the, the life insurance company right now is paying a cap rate of 9%. They have the contractual right to reduce that to a 4% cap rate, which by the way, a 4% cap rate is lower than the illustrated rate. And I can't tell you how many life insurance illustrations, the current Inforce illustrations is one of the reasons I'm doing the IUL challenge that 10 years ago were ran and the illustrated rate is higher than what the current cap rates are. Because after a period of time goes by, the insurance company can reduce the cap rates on old products and keep having new marketed products come out at higher cap rates. That's part of the game in, for a lot of these companies. Not every company, but a lot of them. Now, full transparency, Nationwide hasn't been around that long, so they haven't uh, kind of weathered all of that, but I've yet to see a, uh, a company in the IUL business hit the 10 year mark without reducing cap rates substantially or, or reducing policy performance. So we get here, uh, the floor rate, it's protected at zero. You can't lose your money. Now you can see here the index stre uh, interest strategy charge. You can see it's charging zero right now, but they can actually increase it to 50 basis points there. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but it's actually a lot when you consider they don't need to uh, even reduce the cap rate. They could just kind of slide that charge in there and nobody typically would be of the wiser, right? So now we get to the, the S&P 500 uncapped rate right here. And you could see, here's the deal. Look at this. There's always either a cap rate, there's a participation rate, or there's a spread charge, right? So we got these things, par rate, cap rate, spread charge, or participation rate, right? Um, and so when we look at this, we got the uncapped S&P 500. It's got a 100% participation rate, and that's 100% guaranteed. So that part of it is good. But now we have a spread rate. So what does this spread rate mean? It means right now the spread rate is 7.5%. So if the S&P 500 does 10%, the first 7.5% is going to be taken off the top. So you're only going to get credited 2.5%. So you're gonna have a, maybe some of these years, like let's go back to the March of 2020 to 2021 for that year, right? And, and that may be a good year where you have a huge gain, but the bottom line is all the other years where, where, you're, where you're looking at that, that most years the S&P 500 doesn't do more than 10%. So this spread charge is gonna wind up working against you and, and, and you're gonna get credited less and less and less in other years. So while you think you're getting way ahead of this, you're really not. Now you can see that that internal rate of return is higher, um, and you know than the 6.32%. You know because of the the back testing and and like whatever uh, it looks like based on on their algorithm there. Um, 
But then let's go down, before I go to the proprietary indexes, let's go to the one year high cap. It's 11% with a 4% guarantee, so that looks better than the 9%, 4% guarantee. It's got the 100% participation rate. But here you can see the strategy index charge is 1%. So what is that? That they're charging you more and they have the ability to raise it to one and a half percent, right? So there's always fees that you have to be able to look in here and, and levers that the life insurance company can, can kind of move to their own benefit. Now, this uncapped product right here has a spread charge, right? That's what it does. This seven and a half percent spread charge can be increased to 10%. That's what they mean. It cannot go higher than 10%. That's what the 10% guaranteed means in that instance. Now, let's get down, um, because I've done videos on this specific product a lot, and I've had a lot of people be like, oh, that's garbage, I would never use that, that spread charge. Well, you know, in this specific product, which I know this is a big world financial group product, um, and I know other people sell it as well, but more WFG sells more of this than anybody else. And when I look at this and I go, okay, this is the only S&P, if, if you were to do an IUL, you always want to do the S&P because all the other indexes like I'm, I've been talking about over here, they're just manipulative and they're, they're quite frankly, they're garbage um, and, and they're super dangerous to get involved with. And there's a lot of other variables that get into it. So let's get into all these uncapped products right here. Yes, they're proprietary, but I think you understand my position on that. Let's just assume you don't care, right? Now let's look at what they, what they are. So you get an uncapped, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go everything below this line is uncapped, right? We got all these uncapped right here. One, one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And you can see we got 115% participation rate, 145, 135, 170, 175, and 220. Now, here's the deal. We also look at this and they go, oh, they could drop this participation rate to 65%. 65, 65, 65, 65. So what does that mean? This means if the S&P 500 does 10%, if they, they have the ability right now at 10% here, it's not the S&P 500. If whatever this BMPP Global H Factor High Par Select Index does, <laughs> I don't even know what that is, but if it, whatever that does, if it did 10%, right now you're getting 220% of that, right? Uh, that means, uh, or no, you're getting 220%. Yeah, no, that's what it is because it's uncapped. So you'd be getting 220 of that. So you get like 22%, right? Which is great but they have the ability to reduce it to 65%. So it looks really good because remember, this assumption of 6.81 and, and this back test is based on the current 220% cap rate. As soon as you reduce that cap rate to uh, less than, it doesn't even have to go down to the 65%, it goes down to 150, these numbers get thrown all out of whack. It, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't work, right? So now I'm gonna switch to red. And so these other ones you could see um, the particip or the floor rate, they're all guaranteed, right? There's no spread charges. There's no spread rates here. There's no spread rates and that's fine. Um, these high ones, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this a little bit just cause it's a little sloppy. Um, I don't want those disclaimers as far as personal information for people going out there. So I'm gonna recover that up. Uh, so what we have here is we, we have, um, Right here, I just want to kind of recalibrate this and, and re-talk about it. You have 220% cap rate down to 65. You can see this is the highest participation rate of all of these uh, participation rates right here, right? Every one of them has the ability to be dropped to 65%, right? There's no spread rates here, which is, you know, uh, what the S&P 500 has. And you can see up here on these, there's no index interest strategy charge rate charge. But then on the higher rates right here, all of a sudden we have these charge rates added in, right? And so that matters a lot. You know, these charge rates are coming out no matter what, that gets taken off, off the top, right? And so when, when you talk about um, how the policy is actually gonna perform and, and compound, you have to look at all of the different variables and how they impact. And the important thing to understand, and this is the really, really important thing to understand, is that this column right here that I'm showing, right here, this column of this maximum permitted illustration rate, that column is based on the fact 
that you're running everything. It's based on the fact that the assumptions stay at the current rates. That's what it's assuming. As soon as those rates drop, this performance goes down as well. And now, the, the, once again, the life insurance company has all the control in the world to do that to you. So when we look at, okay, participation rate, or like, okay, we have a cap rate here, uh, up here, and then the rest of these are a lot of them. Most of them are uncapped, right? You got these two here, but it doesn't matter. We're not gonna worry about those. But when we look at all these different uncapped products, there's different, all these different moving levers, right? At the end of the day, what, what matters here? Um, and I'm gonna show you here. What matters is what index, index you're, what index you're using. And then we gotta look at the options budget. I'm gonna just write option budget. And then we have to look at options cost. Okay, so when we look at those things, I'm just gonna use the S&P as an example, right? Just to keep things equal. So when we look at the S&P 500, and we, then we look at the cap, par, participation rate, that's what par is, and then we look at the spread, spread, spread rate, okay? These are all the variables that come into play for the S&P 500. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we have a cap rate that's 9%, if we have a participation rate that's 100 or 140%, you know, because these numbers can get reduced, or if we have a spread rate that's seven and a half percent, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the fact that these could be three different products, right? Three completely different indexing strategies. But at the end of the day, the the very the options cost. So it's one, two, and three right here. These are the variables that matter. So if we have these different strategies that are gonna illustrate differently and be able to be sold differently. At the end of the day, you're still dealing with the same options budget, the same options cost, because it's the options for this index, right? And we're dealing with the same index. So the you, dollars in, dollars out is not gonna change, right? Because if the options budget is, let's say 4%, right? You have $10,000. That means you got that you got a $400 option budget on $10,000 of cash value in the policy, right? So now then you have the options cost. Well, what do those options cost? In a volatile market, which we have right now, and in a market where more IUL companies are buying more, uh, more options, and so supply and demand is what drives the options market, right? So in that market, options costs go up. And so options costs go up. That is why cap rates have come down. Like, so people need to understand, even the spread charge or the participation rate has nothing to do with what the index is doing. A lot of people mis misinterpret, misunderstand. Life insurance companies don't care. They're simply mitigating your risk. You're, if you have an uncapped index, your performance of any of these uncapped indexes have nothing to do with what the indexes do and everything to do with what the options budget is, what the options costs are, and what index is uh, because the, the index is gonna drive really what the options cost is, right? And so that is the only thing that matters. If you don't understand that, you shouldn't sell these and you shouldn't buy these, right? And, and when you do understand that, you start to realize, wow, the way that companies buy these IUL products um, and, and the way that they buy these options is not really done in the way that a lot of people think of options from this kind of like sexy, high return performance because there's a lot of risk in these people that are trading options and, and doing this speculative stuff. There's a reason life insurance companies call it a hedging strategy when they do their options. It's because they're trying to utilize it as kind of like a break-even strategy. That's what a hedge is, is to take risk off the table. And so they're doing this. So to think that you're gonna use this options budget, which is created by the general performance of the general fund, and then the options cost, and that you're gonna, you're gonna do amazingly is, is, is just asinine to me. The reason that over the past decade in the greatest bull run of all time that all IULs have underperformed pretty much like 99.5, 99.9% of IULs have underperformed the way they were sold has nothing to do with it, with the index. And that is proof that the indexes have nothing to do with this. The market performance has nothing to do with this. It always has to do with this. The bottom line is over the past decade, general fund performance has come down, options costs have gone up. So regardless of what the market does, the performance of IUL has to come down. I A lot of people misinterpret and they think, oh, if this spread, this spread, they're gonna change it from like like 135 here, 
a lot of people think they're gonna, the life insurance company, like in this situation right here, I guess, let's say, they think that you're gonna reduce it. If they reduce it from 145 to, to 100, even though they could drop it to 65, let's say they drop it to 100, a lot of people think that the life insurance company is making more money there. That's not the case at all. They're not making more money at all. They just have to do that because of what can they actually afford to do. From that perspective, the life insurance company just has to make sure they meet their needs and their expenses and so on and so forth. Um, but the bottom line is they actually end up underperforming because the, the company has to reduce that performance based on these variables here. And it really is not more complicated than that. And so um, here's the deal. I hope that helps. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, I would say uh, feel free to reach out, comment in the comment section below. Uh, this is really important to understand. And I know a lot of people are misrepresenting what these IULs are, what they do, what the cap rates, uh, what the uncapped products are all about, how flexible they are. The bottom line is nothing could be further from the truth. Um, do they offer flexibility? Sure, but with that flexibility comes a lot of landmines. Um, and when it comes down to it, the overriding principle is an IUL is never gonna be able to, from a long-term perspective, be able to outperform the general fund of the life insurance company. Common sense tells me if, 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 if they could go out and do this, and if this were, when you understand this is how they do it, the options budget and the options cost, and you look at that, if they were able to do that and go out and let's just say get you this 6.81%, uh, which is the maximum permitted illustration rate, in which all these IUL agents are saying, oh, that's just really conservative, because look at of look on that proprietary index, it's, it's ridiculous. If the, if the insurance company could do that in a world they're having a hard time getting 4.5% in their general fund, they'd be doing it for themselves. IUL, after all your costs of insurance and admin fees and all that stuff, they'd be able to get 75 to 8% without all those expenses in the general fund. But they don't do that because it doesn't work that way because they understand most. So anyway, I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, once again, comment. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell, that way you're notified. Check out the Index Universal Life playlist. I've got a whole training playlist that goes into a completely deep dive. I'm gonna put it on the end screen here. You can actually click on it right now. Go check it out. And uh, till next time, have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll talk soon.